Good afternoon. How was lunch? Great. No food coma. Great. <laughs> okay. So, uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Victor and I'm part of the so-called unstructured data team of Dell EMC. And um, we have picked up um, a topic today to, to actually not only talk but discuss with you about data and how data becomes um, a capital for us. <clears throat> yeah, let's try it. The batteries of the slide changer finished. So uh, basically we, um, we try to take the discussion into how you can treat your data, uh, how your data becomes really valuable to you in the context of course of um, uh, products and solutions that we offer. And uh, also at the end we will discuss some references. But uh, before this, I want to ask a question. Do you think it's an interesting topic nowadays? Yeah, that's um, a very nice movie which I highly recommend to you. You can go on HBO and just see it. It's called Brexit, the Uncivil War. But look what it says here. Every know, everyone knows who won, but not everyone knows how. So that's the key thing. So. In this movie, I'm not discussing if it is, I'm just discussing the fact um, they actually show you uh, how data was used to achieve something. And you can see that the whole game was conducted through data. So I picked up um, a very interesting scene of five seconds. No, it doesn't work. So, what did the guy say? So this is a scene between some lobbyists and politicians, and the sentence is, money is one thing, Mr. Banks, data is power. So the politician was saying, I don't need the money anymore. I just need the data of the people to achieve my goal. And uh, one more thing, who remembers the 10-year challenge on Facebook we recently had in the end of 2018? Okay, so what we decided to do is pick up the companies by market capitalization with 10 years difference exactly and we keep it 2008 2018 just for the purpose of accuracy so in 2018 what do we have oil company an industrial powerhouse telecom company fmcg company consumer goods banks warren buffett warren buffett <laughs> and again a <laughs> consumer goods company and you see only one data-driven company, but that's the result in 2018. So basically, all these companies actually have data as an asset um, at the core. And uh, I picked up some nice um, examples of the value of data that such companies have. Caesars Entertainment uh, filed for Chapter 11 in 2016-17. So Chapter 11 is basically the process of bankruptcy in um, the US, you get protection, and then they start to resell your assets. So data, actually, the customer loyalty data was the asset that was sold for most money, a billion dollars. Nobody cares about you know, estates, nobody cared that much about the slot machines and all the equipment, but they paid this amount of money for the data profiles. You know, you enter the casino, probably they know you better than yourself and your parents when they make a psychological profile inside. How you play, you give your passport, your photo, and then they can tell you what problems in life you have or what challenges are facing. Tesla, because I see that you're from automotive industry. So the big game with Tesla is the, actually the data collection that they have from the cars. And that's a real data capital. It's another interesting company, it's called Mobileye. It's an Israeli company owned by Intel right now. So you know what the guys are doing? They're putting cars in cities around Europe. They, f they basically film the cities and then they sell the data. They provide data so you can build applications. You name it, traffic jams, navigation systems, parking, helping and all that stuff. And this is on top of the <coughs> um, development of autonomous driving. So at the end of the day, the data that you collect is, uh, is a real value. Um, Netflix, we all know, Equifax is not that popular company, but the breach of the data, this is the amount that 
cost of them. So when you have the data, we also talk about the security of the data, big time. So in order for data to become a real value, here are the typical challenges that most of our customers or all the customers in the world face nowadays. Data trapped in silos. So if the data is spread around, yes, you can have access to it, but can you do something much more? It will be quite tough. Bring in the data, compute the data, produce something for you. Data is growing very fast. Um, and I'm not uh, referring to a data in the database, but rather um, unstructured data which is everywhere. So the moment you start to collect something, you may end up from zero to five petabytes, to five petabytes in just a year. And I'll give you such examples. And last but not least, actually we need this data to provide information and knowledge. Because having data for the sake of having data is only too expensive, nothing more. What are still most of the landscapes today that we have? You know, it's structured, it's in our database, we know it, we deal with it, it's many zeros and ones. It grows, oh, sorry, it grows linearly 10-15%, your SAP database, for example. Um, it is contained, it means it is in your data center, but this is the data of your own company. This is not the data from the outside, outside world. When you start to take the data from the outside world, this is how a landscape would look like. Most of the data will be unstructured. It will grow probably 50% per year, probably sometimes more. Uh, and most important, it will be distributed. So you have to take all these data from the edges. This is the computers of your customers, the mobile devices of your customers. The, all the cameras that you have, all the cars that you collect the data. So you transfer it, you need to find a solution where to put it in the data center. Real time. Well, nowadays, the data also in some aspects is real time data. I mean, you either manage to use it now or it doesn't, it's not worth it anymore. And we have a very interesting future project that I will talk about a little bit later. This is a Gartner calculation that 80% of the data is unstructured. Typically file data, object data. Any of you using or having object data or using object storage in your environment? For file storage, you use for sure somehow. What about object? No one? Okay. And for the real time, we actually call it streaming data. This is like a waterfall that comes you either utilize it now, or then it doesn't work uh, anything for you. Our unstructured data vision, we basically have the three types, file, object, stream, like we mentioned, but we want to put it in a certain you know, frame, how it looks like. We need to make a unified data lake, and I really like this term, this is basically the place, the, the place where you can put all your data, all types of protocols, all types of data. This data lake can simply grow because one of the biggest challenges is when my data is growing, how am I handling this? From a human perspective, from data center uh, perspective, from electricity, uh, air conditioning perspective, all of that. And at the end of the day, how this data or what analytic applications we can put on the data lake so it starts to bring us some real um, insights. I look at our um, files. Basically for the files we need our file system to take all types of loads. We start from archiving file loads, we go through um, hybrid systems, and we go to the almost real-time or very high-performance systems that require um, flash. And we need to scale in the manner of compute and performance and storage space capacity at the same time. Because you know what, what's the graph? Basically, if you have a standard new controller system, you add the disk, but at some point the graph looks like this. You get higher performance, but then it goes down. It simply cannot handle anymore. Uh, you need a solution where you basically grow like this. If you have an access, it goes like this, performance and capacity. 
and that's exactly what the Bell EMC IC long is. It looks like this, like many other solutions, but the real, <laughs> the real thing is on the inside. And here is what we have uh, very special <laughs> on the inside. So, what is important about uh, uh, the IC long? The, um, the real heart is called the, the one test system, where in the single file system or namespace, you can have up to tens of petabytes. If you need to be exact, it's 68. Um, this is how you actually get rid of the silos and you consolidate them um, in a single view. So it's the same storage administrator that manages 100 terabytes or can manage half a petabyte or two petabytes of data because he, he has actually the same things to do on a daily basis. If you have silos, Let's count the, the, the people that need to handle it and all the manual work that you need to do. Uh, simplicity and ease of use, same. Uh, from the operating system wise, actually we have it in the single namespace. And from, um, let's say, hardware point of view, the system grows very easily. So you set up the system and then you can grow in increments. First thing, you grow as much as you need. You don't need to buy additional capacity. You start with 100 terabytes, you grow to 150, you grow to 200, you grow to 250, and so on. And uh, migrations and upgrades happen very easily. So basically, you plug into the new system, the data is moved, and then you just get a larger, just view like you have on your C drive on the Windows um, view. Also, migration of data, you can put your old cluster and your new cluster together, they can migrate the data and take it out. Otherwise, I think that many of you have had migration pro projects. Actually, this is the biggest risk and one of the most expensive things, to migrate two petabytes of data from one cluster to another cluster. Now, that's, that's the big game. Um, it doesn't only cost money, it costs a lot of time. And if you need to transfer data for two to three months, it's... Um, it can be a real burden to the business. Like we discussed, linear scalability, so you grow into increments, and automated, uh, automated policy tiering of data. That's very important, because very often your data lake has, um, okay, let's imagine an HPC environment or artificial intelligence environment. You have a layer which is quite fast, so you can run all the algorithms that you teach the software, and then at the moment that you don't need the data, this goes to the lower layers. And this happens automatically. You just set up the right policies at the moment, and the data is moved, uh, the system moves the data by itself. Global availability and protection, like we saw with uh, the earlier example of the company, how much money this can cost us. So from technical point of view, uh, the ISLON is a node-based system. So with every three nodes, you have one node that is protecting the whole environment. Basically, the system can lose up to 25% of its capacity, and still it is running and your data is there. And on the other side, um, we work a lot on the <coughs> security of your data from crime perspective. So we have a lot of partnerships regarding uh, security of unstructured data, very important into GDPR compliance. So you have a view of the data, who accesses the data, who is doing what. And believe me, we've run uh, demo environments. You cannot imagine what you find out when you run a risk assessment of the data. Like uh, at some point that half of the people in the company have an access to a CEO email. You know, you can never imagine that until you actually dig into the, dig into the subjects and permissions that have been given five years ago. And now a set of new employees can access the data that is, you know, and you can be fined big time. I think the fine is like, what, up to 4% of the uh, yearly revenue of a company, if it's a telco company. It can sometimes really put you in danger if you stay in business or not. Last but not least, we start to talk about storage efficiency. Because at these amounts of data, it is very important how much space is taking in your data center. Sometimes, um, we do, let's say, competitive analysis, and a competitive system takes two racks, not one rack. 
and then that makes a huge difference for the customer because putting a second rack sometimes means buying UPS systems, air conditioning, additional cooling, and you know something may be a little bit cheaper on the data sheet, but if you want to use it, it's a completely different story. Um, in large clusters, we reach up to 80% efficiency row to usable capacity. So if you want two petabytes of data, you don't need to buy 3.2, for example, you know, and use three racks in your data center. In terms of the workloads, I'm pretty sure we have automotive, media, banking industry, security industry here. So file shares and home directories is the natural use case for a nice enterprise system like an Isilon. Then we go into high performance computing environments where actually Isilon is a very good data repository there because it gives you all of the capacity and all the throughput of the system. So what I didn't mention is that all the nodes can give you throughput at the same time. So this is unmatchable in standard dual controller systems. All your digital content, it can be from the cars that take the videos on the road, it can be from your digital marketing departments, it can be all your media assets. This is the place to be. Analytics, I will say one thing, uh, IC1 is the only storage on the market that speaks the Hadoop protocol, which means that uh, you directly use the storage for taking the Hadoop data out. Um, otherwise, you know, if you go with the standard environment, you need to triple the, triple the data because you keep the data, then you move it to a layer of where it is used and comes back and you need another layer to secure the data. So with Isilon, when our Hadoop environment grows above 50 terabytes, then we can have a very good uh, discussion on this. In terms of security, more cameras, more, def more higher resolutions, and uh, higher retention times. And this is only on the storage perspective. When we start to do analytics based on the video, this is, um, again, a place where we need very high performances. Did any of your marketing departments told you that they want the social media data to be stored? Probably they will request you soon, and this is again a case in which you can end up into a petabyte of data just in the in a matter of one year. Archive and backup. Also, we have our slower nodes where they can be used as archives and um, backup in certain situations. For example, um, typical very good use case for backup for Isilon is a TSM environment, IBM TSM, because. Usually this is large environments, a petabyte, a half a petabyte, and all these nice functionalities of the ice on the automated distribution of the data actually solves the issue and the manual work when you need to uh, manage one byte, petabyte of a backup. You know, not only backing up the process, but then you need to manage the data and find it back into the system. Object storage. Um, uh, Anybody unaware of the difference between file and object in the room? Because I have a very nice example on the difference on storing the data on a file storage and storing it on an object storage. It's like parking your car. If you park your car in a mall, for example, you have, the other day I had B09. So there is a file path. I know where to find the file. The system remembers it. It grabs it back. If I give my car to a parking valet, I just get a ticket. I don't know where the car goes. I hope it comes back. Usually it comes back, <laughs> but, <laughs> but still, the only thing that you have is actually uh, the parking ticket. You give it back, and that's like the metadata. In an object storage, there are no tiers. You just throw the data into a pool, and each um, object has quite rich metadata to recognize. Another good example, if you store a picture of your dog on a file storage, what do you have? Uh, name of the picture, size of the file, and where it is. But on an object storage, you can put the name of the dog, the season in which it was taken, the photographer, and all these stuff, and this is how you recognize it. And um, object is getting more and more popular, especially when we start to discuss um, cloud-scale storage. I mean, 
growing very fast and shrinking very fast sometimes. Um, global data access and cloud native applications. By cloud native applications, we mean applications that can be accessed globally, that can transfer the data globally, and uh, that have the required um, security level for transferring data into such, um, such distances. This is why ECS is uh, what we also call it an S3 storage. You know, because the S3 protocol is a protocol which you can transfer these amounts of data. Your YouTube application is a typical example of how you use a data, an object storage. If you just decide to copy the link to send it to somebody, you see quite a long thing. And then you see numbers and letters, actually that's the metadata. And you can send it to someone in the US and you actually, both of you will access the same video. It's just that the application and the whole system balances the data between Europe and the US, but you access actually the same video. And that's the metadata of the video. Again, this is how the ECS looks like. Yeah, the difference is ISO and ECS, but um, in the back, it's again a scale-out node-based architecture with um, a couple of very important functionalities. Uh, unlimited object storage. And why we call it unlimited? Because Previously, you know, an object storage has a limit not only on the capacity in terms of terabytes or petabytes, but it has a limit on the number of objects that you store. Because sometimes you may have 50 terabytes of object storage, but it can be millions of objects inside. You know, so this is several aspects of how we look at the system. Um, very high security and compliance. Very often object storage and ECS is used in um, banking sector, for example, where you need to uh, archive data under heavy uh, regulation. The comprehensive API data access, this means that we can adapt the solution for different applications to access the data there. It has its multi-tenant architecture, that's why we call it object storage. So object storage because it can exist in a cloud, it can be put in your data center, you can the private cloud, but by default you have the multi-tenant architecture inside. And again, last but not least, the built-in metadata search. So again, this is native for the system, and um, I want you to remember one thing. If you take a different approach on object storage, very often you need, for example, to add um, a SQL database so you can put in the metadata inside, because that's a significant part of uh, the whole concept of the object storage. With an ECS, actually we have it uh, natively inside. And like we discussed, the way you can consume it, most often like a turnkey appliance in your data center, also as a software defined solution. This means that you can have some um, standard Intel based hardware and you can run the software um, upon it. This is how we create the so-called performance object clusters that are used for high performance applications, but they still need a object storage. Uh, for example, all the mobile applications that we use are basically an object storage solution, like, like the YouTube, because you access the same app from different parts of the world. And this is uh, the only way for you to have a worldwide access to the same thing, no matter where you are. You can build your dedicated internal cloud, and you can have it dedicated in some another cloud. Now, on the dedicated cloud, what is the interesting story? Tell me one thing. If there are a lot of customers coming back from the cloud, or they went to the cloud and they want to build a hybrid cloud model, and this, is, this happens quite a lot, which is easier? Put an S3 storage like an ECS, or rewrite the application? I think that um, the answer is the first option, and uh, this very often starts to be the case. Not that much in Central and Eastern Europe, but in Western Europe, so soon it will um, also come to us. Okay. The wide variety of workloads. Tiered archive, so ECS is a very good tiered archive to your existing storage, Iceland or data domain, so you can easily tier your call data there. It sees it like a um, cloud storage. Uh, and let's not forget that object storage is basically the cheapest storage per terabyte. You know, that's, uh, that's in the nature of the solution. We can do cloud backup, 
sinking shares where we don't need that high performance and the so-called uh, platform three applications, mobile, IoT, and analytics. IoT, actually, I recently heard the term that is not IoT anymore, it's IOE. It's the internet of everything. Because by 10 years from now, we will have 50 billion devices connected. So all these small objects need to stay somewhere and uh, the applications need to know where um, this is it. And here we can consolidate and archive at very low costs. By low costs meaning that it's low cost and it's fast to find the data. Because uh, when you have discussion with uh, customers <coughs> talking about um, tape replacement, of course the tape is cheaper on a cost per dollar, but finding out the data from the tape and being sure that the data is there, you know, the tape is not going wrong or stuff like this, or um, very often banks, for example, transport the tapes to a special device, and when you take all these costs, uh, nowadays it starts to be much cheaper just to have a very good object solution in your data center for um, this thing. And then, like we said, when you start to think about cloud native applications, please call us. We will we can help you a lot on this. Stream. This is um, something that is still called Project Nautilus. Uh, it's a product that we let's say it's a turnkey appliance that we plan to. Um, hopefully, Martin, maybe you can correct me, but. In some months, maybe we will have it available. It's being uh, better tested in some customers. Yeah, it will be Christmas, Christmas present. Christmas present. For whom? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> That's the question. For whom? So, uh, streaming data is um, basically taking your data into real time, manipulating the data, working with the data, and then transferring the data to uh, another tier of storage. Um, we had typical examples with, um, let's take for example, an online shop on Christmas time, you know, with all the people that log in. So the person logs in for one hour. If you have a good customer profile and you can see what he's interested in and proposing the best offering for this hour, then you will be more successful in selling on Christmas than if he just enters and starts to look and maybe he loses interest, you know, all these, all these commercials that you get all the time on the internet are actually based on streaming data. But I think your consumption preferences and then getting the right offer. I think we had uh, with Tesco quite interesting uh, approach. Somebody enters the supermarket, he's there for half an hour. You know, if you manage to recognize him and, okay, they cannot bring you a product, but you know, you have throughout the supermarket commercials, information, where is what, where is what, so this can be um, individualized quite a lot. And there are many aspects of streaming data and uh, being able to handle it. You know, there are tools like uh, Kafka, for example, which you need uh, to put in there. The good thing about our appliance is that you will come ready with all these tools inside in the appliance. And this gives the capabilities of uh, auto-scaling of data streams, because data streams have sometimes uh, unexpected flow. You know, you have very high in the morning, lower in the afternoon. The system will be able to handle it. Improve data durability. One of the most important things in real-time data is the validity of the data. Is the data correct? So uh, the system has very, very high compute capabilities to extremely fast validate the data. And uh, so the data can actually provide some information. And some other characteristics that I will move on because we're a little bit ahead in time. And this is the full spectrum of performance. And of, very often I imagine it like a um, cascade of several lakes, you know, with a hydro power plants. So the real-time data moves to flash file system, hybrid file systems, and then you can go with archive file systems of cloud native storage, ECS, to tier your data. So that's a very nice, uh, you know, a picture speaks a thousand words of, of how the data flows. 
and actually our ability to cover the full spectrum of the unstructured data workloads. Okay. And among our customers in the region, because uh, we really want to show you what we are doing in Romania, in Bulgaria, in Hungary, you know, in the countries that are <coughs> in quite similar profile to us. This is a very interesting company, it's called Rimats. And besides um, actually uh, developing an electric hypercar, um, I, I was very interested to learn that uh, the real patent of the car is actually an IP patent. It's the ability of a computer in the car and the software to provide 100 commands per second to each of the electric engines. That's how you can actually put 2,000 horsepower, you know, that they start to make some sense on the road. Otherwise, if you don't have this system, it's actually an IT patent. And uh, this company is developing autonomous driving systems, so they use our solution for, uh, for this. Um, a very interesting thing we had in Romania is related to smart city. So having several thousand cameras and holding the data only for six months results into petabytes of data being stored. Uh, NIS is a company that uh, is actually a Hungarian company. It's owned by the Hungarian government and basically uh, we call it the data, the e-government data lake. So they start to collect actually all the unstructured data of the electronic government on our cluster, consolidated. It's quite big by the way, it started with something like 5 petabytes. It's a, it's a very nice reference. Good reference from the media sector. This is a company called UPP. Um, there's something like a small jewel that we have in Central and Eastern Europe. They're based in Prague and they're doing visual effects for a lot of um, US productions mainly. Like Wonder Woman, Blade Runner 2049, they have their movies have Oscar nominations, Emmy Awards. Um, actually, it's uh, raw 4K material. So at some point in time, they have a flash cluster of Isilon. They use huge throughput and performance to, to work on the videos because um, they bring them something, and in a matter of half to one hour, they need to they need to work on the on the raw materials and in a special sequence. So this is where it requires a lot of performance that only can ICMON deliver as a file system. A1, the group of telecom operators, besides that A1 has uh, telecoms and banks typically have large file shares, they also hold all, the, all their IPTV content on ICMON, um, which they distribute to millions of people in, in each country in which they operate. Um, OTP Bank, very good customer all over the region. Uh, with them we have uh, highly compliant archives on ECS with the system and uh, Societe General, file systems, now they start to have the Hadoop environments there. The um, whole story is that once you get an Iceland or an ECS, it only adds to the workloads. So we have customers that started with Iceland for the broadcasting department, then they added the file, set, the, the file systems there, they added their backups, they added their archives, so the system only grows because besides managing three other systems, actually they realize that in one storage, file storage, they can have several, several of their workloads there. So this is Martin's idea. My message with this slide is please challenge us. So we can talk for hours about the products, but um, always ask for more from your, uh, always ask more from your data and talk to us what we can do with the data together. And uh, ask uh, your solution to be used in the best possible way. Because very often you will find out that uh, your nice file storage can be much, much more than a single file server. It can be much, much more than just keeping some backups or some archives there. And uh, we can, <coughs> of course, take you to a lot of customers to see that. And uh, at the end, I want to say that these two products, Isilon and ECS, are the fastest growing storage products in the LMC. And uh, actually, the, the only growing storage segment in the world nowadays is actually the unstructured data. You know, by default, block storage is either flat or even going down a little bit. 
in terms of the amounts of data that you store there. All the data growth that you see is um, actually um, goes to file and object storage. I can say that in the last year, in our Eastern Europe countries, we grew something like 50% on the year over year. Okay, any questions? I think we have a couple of more minutes, three minutes left. Pablo, can I comment this car? Please. Yeah, I don't know if you, if you know the story about this car. Uh, this is McLaren F1 that uh, Roman Atkinson, like Mr. Bean, uh, bought it. And uh, then he crashed it. He crashed it twice. And then when he crashed it, the guy from McLaren uh, called him and said, hey, Mr. Atkinson, we will repair the car because we never trust any services uh, that they will make it uh, like we. We want to have it, so they repair it twice, McLaren originally in their factory, and then Robert Atkinson sold this uh, two times uh, crashed car for eight million pounds. Yeah. Some crazy guy. <laughs> eight million pounds for two times crashed car, and he's like uh, a sports. Yes, two times. Yes, yeah, because it's the car that he crashed. Yeah. But uh, everybody know everybody who is fan of this uh, fast cars knows that uh, Robert Atkinson is. Uh, He's uh, attending lots of uh, champions, uh, like amateur champions in driving cars. So he drive car fucking fast, so I can imagine what was the discretion. So yeah, you know another interesting story about uh, McLaren. Um, there was an interesting story in the US, so McLaren F1 was a very limited car in the end of the 90s. You know, if you have this car, you really show something. So there, there is a guy that went uh, to McLaren in the US and he said, um, can we have some kind of a guarantee that I will be the only guy in the neighborhood with such a car? And of course he buys the car. <laughs> and then another rich guy on the street has another <laughs> McLaren F1. So this was the, the real ugly, <laughs> ugly story for him. But, you know, I, I was wondering how many times Mr. Bean crashed uh, uh, this one and how much they sold it uh, after this. But um, the whole idea is... Um, Think twice when uh, you get proposals for, ah, it's a block storage, but we put a NAS filler on top of it, and this will provide you good things, or we put some filler that works on the HDFS protocol. Very often, you end up in things like this. And uh, typically, they can be very cheap on the first, you know, on the first read of, uh, of the configuration, but then living, uh, the cost of living with the system, and with growing the data in it is the real, um, is the real challenge that um, we all face nowadays. Okay, good. Thank you so much.